Thank you very much, Jojo, and um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Henry Coles. I'm the head of the airline distribution standards team at IATA. So my team looks after uh, various passenger standards, um, and we've had, as Jojo mentioned, several changes to the various standards that support involuntary flight changes um, that were adopted last year. So what we're going to do today is just move through uh, these changes. We're going to look at some of the background uh, to irregular operations, and then we will focus on the three main areas of industry standards that are changing. So that's uh, Resolution 830D on travel agency uh, processes, Resolution 735D and 766 on airline processes, and then some changes to the Revenue Accounting Manual on interline billing and settlement processes. What we'll then do is we will bring this all together and look at a uh, end-to-end -end flow on how involuntary flight changes uh, will work from the 1st of June when all of these standards will become effective. So as Jojo mentioned, there is an opportunity uh, at the end of the webcast today to ask any questions. We'll do our very, very best to get to every question uh, today. Uh, for those that we're not able to get to, we will uh, respond to these in writing and you'll get those materials out at the end of the webcast. Um, just to pick up on the point Jojo made also, if you're on the call today and you are not your airline's accredited representative, that's absolutely great, um, but just to note that your accredited representative will be um, directly contacted by the IATA team, so they'll be receiving these materials and a few other bits and pieces. So if you, if you haven't already looped in with that person, um, It'll be a great opportunity to do that and if you're not too sure who that person is please just let us know and and we can flick that through to you so just as a as a background obviously irregular operations are very very stressful for everyone concerned they're, they're very stressful for passengers but they're also um, are not not too pleasant for airline teams either so it's really important that we all have very clear and effective processes that are in place before things go wrong to ensure that everything goes smoothly so some of the changes we have to industry standards uh, work towards this objective ensuring that we're all uh, on the same page and have a common understanding but there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done internally within each airline just to make sure that absolutely every team that touches um, irregular operations is aware of what your airline's process is and um, that that process is designed to ensure your compliance with industry standards. So all of these standards touch a number of different processes and airlines. So um, uh, we have teams impacted such as interline and alliances, airport operations, uh, reservations and ticketing, uh, passenger systems, and then on into the back office with uh, interline billing and revenue accounting. So if you're here today on this webcast uh, representing one of those teams, we'd ask that you please just take these materials materials away and just make sure that they're shared with every impacted team. It's very, very important that um, every team within your organisation is prepared for these changes as there may be some, some updates that are required to uh, processes and procedures. So immediately after this webcast over the next day or so, we will uh, be sharing these materials to everyone that was on the webinar today along with the, the answers to any questions and so that's a great opportunity for you just to flick these on to anyone in the airline uh, that's uh, touched by these uh, changes. So we have a number of industry standards that uh, govern processes around irregular operations. And we're going to look at some of those today. So Resolution 830D is an agency conference resolution that binds all IATA accredited agents and all IATA member airlines. And that outlines reservation procedures that uh, agents must follow. We've had some changes to that resolution, so we'll go through that in just a minute. We'll also be looking at Resolution 735D. This is a passenger services conference resolution that just binds airlines. And so this defines what an irregular operation is. Um, um, and it outlines each airline's obligation uh, to passengers and to each other um, when they're involved in an irregular operation scenario. Resolution 735D is complemented by Resolution 766, which defines uh, interline reservation procedures. And we've had some changes to that resolution with regards to how to obtain inventory from another airline um, following an irregular operation. 
Resolution 722F is another important one. That one outlines procedures for issuing and accepting tickets. We've had no changes to that resolution regarding irregular operations, but we will touch on it later in the presentation. And then finally, we have the Revenue Accounting Manual, um, which is binding on airlines under Resolution 663, and this outlines all the procedures for interline billing. So the, um, the standards we've just run through there, um, Many of those are binding on uh, airlines and 830D is also binding on travel agents. So really important that you're prepared for these changes because you are required to comply with those resolutions as soon as they, the changes take effect. Um, Complementing the resolutions, we have a couple of other uh, industry standards that provide guidance or best practice. So we have things like recommended practice 1735, planned schedule changes, and recommended practice 1701J, which looks at automated self-service rebooking. So it's really, really important that um, every airline has access to the very latest version of all the industry standards. They do change from year to year. Um, most of the airlines that are on the, the webinar today will have access to these manuals. Um, so if you don't know who in your organisation has these manuals, please let us know and we'll try and line this up. Um, if, you, if you don't have access to these manuals, um, you, need to, you need to find out um, need to organise yourself a, a copy. So the um, the Passenger Agency Conference Resolution Manual, which includes Resolution 830D, is uh, publicly available online. And the URL to that is in the in the materials here. Um, and then the Passenger Services Conference Resolution Manual, which includes all the other resolutions, together with the Revenue Accounting Manual, are actually published separately as commercial products uh, by IATA. Um, and they're also available on IATA.org there's a URL in the presentation also. Just a final point on these standards. Um, industry standards are not developed by IATA, they're developed by our member airlines. So if you are not involved in standard development um, activity and you'd like to be, please uh, have a look. We've got a website that's listed there in the presentation about the different groups that we have and the different ways that you can become involved. So if, if you have any questions on industry standards or, or you'd like to propose changes, these standards are all driven by airlines and it's really important that you take part in these activities. So what we're going to do now is just step through some of these changes um, uh, individually. So the first we're going to look at are the changes to resolution 830D and these changes were adopted by the passenger agency conference last year so that's every member airline uh, voting at the agency conference on the agency resolutions that occurred last year for the changes to take effective from the uh, take effect from the 1st of June this year. So resolution 830D uh, defines reservations procedures for accredited agents um, and it forms part of the, of the agency program and the procedures that all IATA accredited travel agents must follow. So we had a bit of a problem with um, some of the processes outlined in resolution 830D and that related to travel agents capturing uh, customer contact information and how travel agents were passing this through to participating airlines. So we had an existing technical standard and that was a, um, a specific SSR entry that if, if a travel agent collected uh, customer contact information that would be transferred through to all the participating airlines within the itinerary, within the PNR. Um, and unfortunately, we, we still had a situation at industry level where very, very often a travel agent uh, may have been collecting customer contact information, but they weren't passing it through to the airline, or in some situations, they simply weren't collecting it at all, or they were including their own customer contact information when they were transferring this through to airlines. And what that meant that was, um, is that in a, in a regular operation situation, often the airline was unable to contact a passenger proactively. And that's when something goes wrong in the operational window, um, often the, the travel agent is, um, is offline or the passenger is in a location where the travel agent doesn't operate. And so it makes the most sense for the airline to be the person contacting the passenger proactively. And where they don't have access to that customer contact information, they're simply not able to do that. 
IATA runs a global passenger survey every year, and this is one of the issues that consistently comes up as a number one complaint for passengers that they're not informed when things go wrong, or their airline is doing something on their behalf, but they're not being told about it. So this is something that's absolutely in everyone's best interest, both airlines and travel agents, um, to ensure that the, the customer is receiving the um, best possible experience, uh, particularly when something goes wrong. So the changes that took effect from the 1st of June, that, that take effect from the 1st of June this year, it's an amendment to paragraph four of the resolution, and it requires agents to um, perform three very important uh, tasks. So the first of these is that they must actively ask each passenger whether the passenger wishes to have their, their contact information, and that could be a mobile number and email, whether they want to have that passed through to all participating airlines in the itinerary for the purposes of contact and an operational interruption. So where the passenger um, confirms that they wish to have this contact information passed through to the airlines, the agent must then ensure that this is entered into the passenger name record, the PNR, in compliance with the technical standards we have in place for this purpose. And so this is around the um, specific SSRs that are already outlined, they're already there in industry standard, and they're published um, in, in our reservation standards. So the third uh, piece that um, the agent must, uh, the fir third activity the agent must perform is that where the passenger does not wish to have their information passed through to the airline, the agent must actively advise the passenger that if they do not uh, 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 pass this information to the airlines that they may not receive information from the airline relating to flight cancellation or schedule changes. So all this all this change does is it really just makes it a little bit more prescriptive and it strengthen, strengthens the language in Resolution 830D around what the travel agent's responsibilities are. Um, and so this kind of complements activity that IATA has run over the last few years to try and raise awareness around this issue of customer contact information. There's really no change to the technical standard. It's all just about um, enforcing the agent uh, process and the agent behaviours to maximise the information that the airlines have at hand uh, to, to proactively contact customers. Now the really important um, thing about this change is that there's a lot of misinformation floating around um, around what this means and, and whether it changes the the uh, travel agent's relationship with the customer. And so what's really important to understand is that all of the, all that this change does is it just makes sure that the, the airline has the uh, correct information, they're able to contact the customer when something goes wrong. So it's not around the airline marketing to the passenger, it's not around um, uh, taking away the travel agency's ownership of the, the customer relationship or the booking or the ticket, it's simply about passing on this contact information for the airline to use proactively when something goes wrong. Um, so the travel agent absolutely still owns the booking and the ticket. The travel agent still has the um, the opportunity to continue to service the customer for subsequent changes. Um, really, just about that that customer contact. So while this is a change to uh, travel agent process, there's some really important actions here for airlines, and this is mostly just around communication with travel agents. So we as IATA, we have um, published a frequently asked questions document directly out to travel agents through BSP Link. We've done that um, this week. Um, we'll also be proactively contacting the travel agency associations to ensure that they're communicating with their, their member travel agents. But um, it's very important that every airline and directly communicates this to your own travel agents also. That's just to make sure that the message is going out um, to frontline agents and also to agency head offices. Um, it's really important that you reinforce that this is around uh, something that's of mutual benefit to customers. It's not around airlines taking ownership. It's not around uh, airline commercial activity. It's really about just making sure that the right person has access to uh, customer contact information at the right time. There's also an opportunity for airlines to reference this language within ticketing policies and also potentially with, within your agency agreements. So um, 
In terms of uh, managing compliance, this is not something IATA is able to do on behalf of airlines because we do not have access to your agency commercial agreements and we don't have access to your uh, reservation data, your reservation systems. So this is something that you're able to um, uh, monitor compliance uh, through your PNR level data, but most importantly, you're also able to reference this in those policies and those agreements if that's what you would like to do. So if you're on the call today and you're not representing teams that would typically interact with travel agents, so that those might be sales teams or um, uh, policy or procedure teams, it's really important that you flick this information through to those teams so that you can work together as an airline to ensure that this policy is, um, is adhered to by travel agents. The other important side of this is that once you have the customer contact information, um, you may have some work to do internally to ensure that your systems are able to use that information. And that's things like um, automating uh, SMS messages or email messages um, or, or ensuring that the right teams within your organisation have access to those telephone numbers if you're making direct contact with passengers. Just the final point here also is that the GDS systems are the systems that kind of sit between the airline and the travel agent and a lot of these processes. And so all of the GDS systems that are active in the market are technically capable of passing this information. And that's something we, um, we kind of managed uh, on behalf of the industry over the last uh, 12 and 24 months. But it's really important that the GDSs are also working proactively with travel agents to ensure that these new behaviors are built into agency processes. So the GDS systems will all have various ways of automating the collection of this information and ensuring that it's passed through to airlines using the industry standards. Um, and so if you have teams that are directly dealing with the GDSs, it's really important that you're also touching base with them to make, make sure that they're um, on the front foot and they're uh, ensuring that travel agents are able to comply with this resolution also. So that's 830D and that's the resolution that um, impacts travel agents. What we're now going to move to are changes to resolutions 735D and 766. And these changes really only impact airlines. So both of these resolutions are binding on all IATA member airlines. Um, and the changes we're about to discuss take effect from the 1st of June this year. So it's really important that you have everything ready um, for the 1st of June so that you're in compliance with these resolutions. Um, with regards to all of your interline partners. So resolution 735D is kind of the overarching resolution that looks at irregular operations. Um, and that, that defines what an irregular operation is. It talks about what each airline's obligation is. It talks about who does what and when, who processes things for the passenger, and what each airline's obligations are with regards to their interline partners. Um, Resolution 766 complements this because it outlines interline reservation procedures and in one particular paragraph that specifically addresses procedures to follow following an irregular operation. So the problem we had with both of these resolutions was that there was a little bit of ambiguity and uncertainty. Um, there was also um, a little bit of a lack of alignment across the two resolutions. And this was uh, specifically around how to distinguish an irregular operation from a planned schedule change. Um, but it also created uh, some confusion or uncertainty around the processes for obtaining prior approval um, from, from new operating carriers and the actual process for booking seats on new operating carriers. So that's something that's been a little bit unclear at industry level, and it's created a lot of um, disputes or confusion. Um, we also had uh, some confusing language around the circumstances in which upgrades to a higher cabin class could be processed. So we had a, a number of um, working groups looking at the different parts of, of those standards across last year and uh, that was airlines and technology providers coming together to discuss these problems and to, to discuss possible solutions. What that led to was a final uh, proposal for changes that, were pre that was presented to the Passenger Services Conference in October last year. That was unanimously um, uh, adopted by all the IATA member airlines that were at the Passenger Services Conference um, to take effect from the 1st of June this year. So um, 
once again, it's really important that you do have access to the latest version of these resolutions. And um, we're just in the final uh, stages of the publication cycle for those uh, new editions of the resolution manual. Those will be out over the next week or so. Um, but what we're going to look at today is, is just the pieces of those resolutions that changed and were adopted last year by the conference. So the very first uh, piece and, and probably the most important piece is that we now have a clear definition within resolution 735D and also um, mirrored in resolution 766 that defines the circumstances in which um, we can assume that an irregular operation has occurred. And so the language in this resolution now refers to um, a circumstance uh, that has occurred on the day a flight is scheduled to depart or the day prior to that flight. And so um, the text within the resolution reads, provided that the circumstances has not occurred earlier than one day prior to the scheduled departure time of the first impacted flight, an involuntary reroute occurs and the provisions of this resolution shall apply. Sounds a little bit um, complicated, but it's super simple. Um, it just means that when something goes wrong, if it occurs on the day a flight was supposed to depart or the day before, we're looking at an irregular operation. And it, if it occurs any early, earlier than that, um, we're definitely not looking at an irregular operation and we must assume that the change is a planned schedule change. Regardless of what is causing the operation, regardless of what has gone wrong or, or who is at fault, we now have this very clear black and white uh, definition that if we're looking at the day of operation or the day before, we're talking about an irregular operation. Any earlier, we're talking about a schedule change. And what this does is that it, it immediately um, uh, determines which path we follow for a number of different processes. And so we're going to be talking more about the irregular operation uh, process within, within the slides today. The really important thing with this definition is that we're looking at when an event has occurred. So an event is something that has gone wrong, an event or a circumstance. And so if a flight is cancelled, that's an event. If a passenger is delayed so that they misconnect, that is an, an event. If a flight is running late because there's, there is an engineering issue, that's an event. And so this is what triggers us to determine whether the Resolution 735D process applies or whether the planned schedule change process applies. So we're not looking at the time a rebooking occurs. We're not looking at the time that a reissue of a document occurs. We're starting at the point that something goes wrong. It's very important. We've also uh, adopted some changes to 735D just to clarify that um, a change of carrier is not actually required. So if something goes wrong and uh, a reaccommodation occurs onto the same carrier but onto a different uh, flight, so a later flight of the same carrier, we can still consider that to be an irregular operation. We've also made um, significant simplifications to the language in the resolution about upgrades. So it's now very, very clear in the resolution that um, unless there is a very clear bilateral agreement between the airlines concerned, um, that upgrading to a higher cabin class uh, shall not occur following an irregular operation. So that removes a lot of uncertainty or ambiguity that was, was floating around. Finally, and, and perhaps this is one of the, the most important points, we've made some uh, changes to strengthen the language about, around the use of endorsements. So the endorsement or restriction area is um, a data element that now exists in electronic ticketing. It relates uh, back to the paper ticket and the endorsement box on a paper ticket. Um, so this is something that's different from the fare calculation area. It's different from any other element um, and it's specifically used to record endorsements when tickets are issued or reissued. So the resolution now requires that if 735D has applied, the characters INVOL, INVOL, must be used in the first five characters of the endorsement area and if resolution 735D has not applied then those characters cannot be used and that's very very important it was something that we didn't quite have that, sa that same kind of strength of language in the resolution previously and it meant that people were often using the invol endorsement for a schedule change or they weren't using the invol endorsement correctly even if an irregular operation had occurred so that's much clearer now 
and it means that if you see your interline partners using that endorsement um, outside of that two-day window, or you see them not using it when an irregular operation has, has occurred, that airline is not in compliance with the resolution, and that's something you can immediately follow up with them. So that's resolution 735D. Um, what we will now move to is the, the complementary process around obtaining inventory, and that's outlined in Resolution 766. So um, Resolution 735D, if something has gone wrong and you're satisfied that uh, the circumstance is a genuine irregular operation, 735D um, gives the passenger the option to obtain a refund or to obtain a, um, a, a new reservation on either the airline they were going to travel on or, or potentially a, a brand new airline and so it's resolution 766 that then outlines the process of how the disrupting carrier goes about obtaining that inventory from a new operating carrier. So we used to have some very uh, sort of confusing and ambiguous language in the resolution um, that uh, spoke about um, uh, telephone conversations and, and uh, uh, directly asking the new carrier for, for inventory um, and that sort of contradicted language that was in 735D about uh, when prior approval was required or was not required and what that meant is that in a number of circumstances some carriers just used published, uh, published system availability to grab seats off a new operating carrier which is technically not in compliance with, with where resolution 766 was landing. So what we've done is we've tidied up Resolution 766 to now require that in every single interline um, uh, relationship, you must have a bilateral agreement on which booking method you agree to use uh, following an irregular operation. And um, what this means is that you just need to have a standing agreement in place. If you're happy for your interline partner to use system availability, that's absolutely not a problem and it just needs to be agreed in writing. Or if you'd prefer an alternative method, and that might be a telephone call, an email, or some other bilateral um, uh, manual or automated exchange of data, that that's simply uh, outlined for, for partners. So Resolution 766 from the 1st of June requires that you're following that bilaterally agreed booking method um, and that provided you're using that method and you're not exceeding any limitations that might be outlined in that message, the new operating carrier is obliged to, to transport that, um, that passenger. So this bilateral agreement um, this is the piece that does require a little bit of attention between now and the 1st of June because many airlines will have a number of interline partners um, with whom they'll need to establish this agreement. And um, many of these agreements will actually exist already. So within various alliances or joint venture relationships, you may already have agreements that look very similar to this. Um, you may also have different agreements within customer communities of uh, passenger service systems um, or in other relationships uh, you have with interline partners. So where you have those agreements, this is a really good opportunity just to kind of make sure they're up to date and, and that you're comfortable with them. Where you don't have those agreements, what we've done is we've created an IATA template just to, to help you along. This is in no way binding. It's just a simple two-page agreement which gives you some idea of, of uh, what this might look like. You're most welcome to use this template. You're also most welcome to pursue uh, an alternative bilateral agreement. So the template that we've drafted, it's just as simple as saying airline one and airline two, the method of obtaining inventory that they agree to use, whether that's existing um, automated arrangements for free sale or, or interactive sale direct access, or whether that's something manual and um, bilateral. And uh, we've included a few other bits and pieces that you may wish to discuss and agree to, things like limitations on the number of seats, things like default processes for booking classes or RBDs, and possibly some other bits and pieces around um, uh, special pro rate agreements for reaccommodation or, or um, the use or preclusion of code share flights. So that template agreement, it will have been shared with your um, accredited representative through the local IATA teams that, that are making contact, but we will also include it with the materials for this webinar um, so that you have that together. And if, if the person from your organisation that manages interline agreements is not on the webinar today, 
really important that you're just flicking this through to them and making them aware of this of this um, uh, requirement. So from the 1st of June, if you don't have a bilateral agreement in place and you need to obtain inventory from a new operating carrier, you must actually make direct contact. That, that's by a phone call or by um, direct face-to-face -face contact at an, at an airport. And that's going to slow you down in these situations where your interline partner is actually happy for you to um, to use system availability. So really important that you're getting this set up in, uh, ahead of the 1st of June. The other point here is that many airlines will have a lot of interline partners. Some of the larger airlines have well over 100 interline partners. So really important that you're prioritising this. You're looking at the um, the partners with whom you have the most uh, reprotection um, and you're getting as many many of these as possible done before the 1st of June. So again, just to summarise the actions here on these changes, the key one is, these, um, is the bilateral agreement. So making sure that that's in place with your interline partners before the 1st of June. Um, if you'd like to, you're welcome to use the IATA uh, template. Um, but the other piece here is that it's really important that all your internal teams um, are, are aware of this change. So it's entirely up to you as an airline um, as to whether your internal teams know about the IATA resolutions or whether you're just designing your own procedures to um, manage your own compliance. But either way, from the 1st of June, you must be in compliance with these resolutions. So that's ensuring that your teams within reservations and ticketing, airports, um, uh, any other customer facing team are aware of these changes and that you've updated any procedures that you needed to. So the last piece of the puzzle is interline billing and um, that involves the Revenue Accounting Manual. Um, the Revenue Accounting Manual outlines all the standards for the billing of interline revenue and some of the processes for settlement also. This is binding on airlines, it gets its authority from Resolution 663, but it is a standalone uh, publication um, with, with its own kind of governance procedure also. So the uh, problem in the Revenue Accounting Manual, similar to the resolutions, there was just some aspects of these um, situations where the standard was not 100% clear. Um, there was a little bit of a grey area with the distinction between irregular operations and schedule change and a little bit of uncertainty around uh, how and when endorsements should be, should be used. So some changes to the Revenue Accounting Manual were proposed in parallel to the changes to the resolutions. These were adopted by airlines at the Interline Billing and Settlement uh, General Meeting that occurred last year in September. And just really important to note is that these changes uh, took effect just slightly earlier. So the Revenue Accounting Manual works to a slightly different cycle. Um, the new edition of the manual takes effect from the first billing cycle in January. So the changes we're looking at today from the first billing cycle in January this year, these changes have already taken effect. So we're running through them today just because they complement and work together with the changes to the resolution. Um, but your Revenue Accounting colleague should have already been made aware of these changes um, and that this would have been published as the outcome to the general meeting last year um, and all of the revenue accounting system providers are generally um, receiving those updates also. So really important to note that the uh, revenue accounting manual just governs the interline billing pieces. So it's not governing any of the processes that occur in the airport. It's not governing any of the processes around ticket reissuance or obtaining inventory. It's just looking at how that flows through to interline billing. And so for that reason, there's a slight difference between the revenue accounting manual and the resolutions, and that's entirely intentional. So the, the revenue accounting manual uh, reflects the fact that that revenue accounting systems often have access to different information and they're processing slightly uh, different um, different kind of process flows. So we have two new provisions that are now um, incorporated into paragraph 2.5 of, re of the revenue accounting manual and that's uh, around a new two-day rule and a new five-day rule. So the two-day rule simply says that sectors on a reissued ticket may only be recognised as an involuntary rerouting when the reissued ticket has an issue date two days or less from the first scheduled departure date. 
So that's kind of reflecting the time frame that's established within the resolution, but it's just translating it into a process that can be run within a revenue accounting system. So instead of looking at an event, um, we're looking at data that a revenue accounting system has in front of it. We're looking at the date of reissue and then the date of the first impacted flight. So this first check is just saying, are those two dates within, within two days of each other? If yes, then carry on. If no, then um, ignore the involuntary designation. And we're going to look at how that process flow looks in just a minute. So the second uh, new process within the Revenue Accounting Manual is a five-day rule. And this is just a second check that performs a slightly different function. So the five-day rule occurs at a coupon level. So instead of comparing the first scheduled departure date to the reissue date, the five-day rule compares the date of the coupon being billed to the reissue date and ensures that this is within five days. And all this does is it just ensures that um, when the reissue has occurred, that only impacted coupons have been reissued. So uh, the resolution is very, very clear that only the impacted coupons, only the coupons that have changed as a result of the irregular operation should be reissued. And in many circumstances, every coupon on the ticket is reissued in error. So what the five-day rule means is that if um, a non-impacted coupon has been reissued in error, and if that's five days or more from the uh, reissue date, the revenue accounting system can ignore that as an error. And it's very, very likely that that will be an error because it's very, very unlikely that if something goes wrong to a passenger's flight in the operational window, that a flight uh, uh, within five days will still be impacted by that change. It doesn't make any sense. So this is just a check and balance to ensure that that has occurred correctly. And just important to note that when counting the number of days for the revenue accounting procedure, the calendar day following the date of reissue is day one. So it's just a slightly different kind of um, frame of reference than the resolution, bearing in mind that we're looking at just slightly different processes. So the action here for airlines on the revenue accounting side, again, this has taken effect from the first billing period in um, January. So it's, it's already in effect for any coupons that have been billed from that first billing period this year. But again, really important just to ensure that all your internal teams are familiar with this change um, and also that you've briefed your revenue accounting system provider. And again, um, we, we engage fairly closely with those system providers on these changes. So if your system provider hasn't um, heard about these changes, I would be very surprised, but really good opportunity just to, to touch base with them. The other point here is that um, there are a lot of internal things, uh, even outside of the industry standards, that there's a close uh, relationship between what happens at the front end of the business, at the airport and in the reservation centre, um, and how that flows through to revenue accounting teams. So we're just encouraging every airline also to take this opportunity to get together internally with all the impacted teams. Just make sure that you have a really clear end-to-end -end process. You know what's happening in every situation, and you're very clear on what the um, impacts are to all your front and back office systems. So finally, just to bring this all together, um, we're just going to step through what this end-to-end -end process looks like from the 1st of June when the changes to resolution take effect. So um, we, we start this process at a point where an interruption has occurred. So um, an event has occurred and the carrier that was supposed to provide a flight is no longer able to provide that, uh, that transportation. So the very first checkpoint um, relates to resolution 735D and that's this um, checkpoint to determine whether the interruption has occurred on the same day as the first impacted flight or the day before. And if that interruption has occurred on the same day or the day before, then we're very clearly on the right-hand side of this process flow, and we're looking at an irregular operation that is defined in Resolution 735D. And that means that Resolution 735D applies. It is the carrier who has caused the disruption um, that is required to uh, find a solution and that is required to process all the required reissue um, uh, transactions on the impacted coupons. If the interruption event has occurred outside of that window, we're very clearly on the left-hand side of the screen and of this flowchart. And that means that an irregular um, uh, 
operation has not occurred, an involuntary reroute as defined in 735D has not occurred, and resolution 735D does not apply. And what that means is that it's no longer the um, operating carrier or the, or the disrupted carrier that's obliged to perform various functions, it is the validating carrier because the validating carrier owns the, the document. And so we're back following existing reservation procedures around notifications of schedule change, and we're back within uh, standard uh, schedule change processes. So we, we do not have a binding resolution at industry level that defines ticketing processes and schedule change, which means that this is up to each validating carrier to follow their own process. They may do this themselves, or they may allow their travel agents to do this on their behalf but we're definitely not within the resolution 735D scope, so we are not um, relying on the disrupting carrier, and most importantly, if we're reissuing any documents, we're not including that INVOL endorsement. So an example of this one, very simple, we've got um, a ticket with uh, two coupons. We've got uh, New York, London departing on Tuesday night, and we've got uh, a connection through to, uh, from London to Paris departing on Wednesday morning. So if the, if the London Paris flight is cancelled on Monday um, at the, the local time of departure, um, the London Paris flight is the first impacted flight. There's nothing wrong with the, the passenger's uh, 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 first flight. It's, it's simply that connecting flight. The cancellation on Monday has not occurred on the day of the impacted flight, and it hasn't occurred on the day prior to this. So resolution 735D very clearly does not apply. The reissued ticket will follow a schedule change process, and the endorsement INVOL will not be used on the ticket. So what um, this then brings us to is the uh, second step, and this is assuming that the uh, passenger does not want to proceed with a refund, and that the original operating carrier is not able to uh, uh, reaccommodate the passenger onto one of their own flights. And so we're in a situation where the original operating carrier, the carrier who has caused the disruption, is now attempting to obtain a seat from a new operating carrier. So this is super simple. The new operating carrier needs to check that a bilateral agreement is in place. Um, and that bilateral agreement is going to outline the booking method for obtaining inventory in these situations. Um, and all that needs to occur is that the uh, disrupting carrier needs to use the booking method um, outlined in this agreement to obtain that inventory. If that bilateral agreement is not in place, or if the carrier is unable to comply with that agreement, perhaps they're booking more seats than the agreement allows, perhaps they're booking within a time frame outside of the agreement, then the disrupting carrier must directly contact the uh, new operating carrier to obtain that inventory. So again, this really just highlights the importance of having that bilateral agreement in place and ensuring that all your internal teams know exactly what the process is with each individual interline partner. And again, to a lesser, a greater or lesser extent, this, this does kind of occur today. So uh, as an airline, you may have very different processes for your joint venture partners um, compared to your non-joint venture alliance partners, compared to your co-chair partners, compared to your uh, standard interline partners. Um, so this is really just ensuring you have absolute clarity with every partner on the method you agree to use and that your teams are aware of those processes and they're using the correct method. So step three involves the reissuing of documents. If we are within the 735D flow, so if we're confident that a genuine irregular operation has occurred, we have the disrupting airline that is responsible for all the reissuance of impacted coupons. Really, really important, this, this is only being processed on the, on the impacted coupons and that any coupons that are still good for passage are being left on the original ticket. Um, and this means that uh, the customer for a, for a short period of time will be traveling with two different tickets. They'll have a new reissued ticket that simply gets them through to their um, point of destination or their point of stopover, and they will have their original ticket with all their original um, booking references and document numbers um, that they're still holding on to, and they will use that for any subsequent non-impacted flights. 
So the process here works exactly as it does today. Um, the disrupting carrier needs to obtain control of the impacted coupons to process the reissue. If they have uh, control of those uh, coupons, that's fantastic. They just need to process the reissue with the correct endorsement, the INVOL endorsement, and they need to make sure that they're leaving all the impacted coupons untouched. If they don't have uh, control of these coupons, they simply need to request control of the coupons directly from the validating carrier. And they can use the involuntary indicator, which is a uh, flag in the electronic ticketing messages. Um, they can use this indicator to let the validating carrier know why they are trying to obtain control of, of coupons. Um, so again, this, this process really doesn't change. It's outlined in resolution 722F, it's referred to in resolution 7 35D. The most important thing here is that um, depending on your system provider, they will have different tools and processes available to you to simplify and automate this process. So the industry standards really just speak to the system to system interaction around electronic ticketing messages and who needs to do, do what when. If you're looking at um, what your frontline agents are actually doing within the system, that's something that you absolutely need to um, discuss internally if you have your own systems or with your system providers if, if you're uh, using a um, external solution. So that then brings us to the final step which occurs after travel has occurred and this is the interline billing step. So this is where we're very um, simply looking at the two day rule and the five day rule. And um, these changes are outlined in the revenue accounting manual and uh, once again these have taken effect from uh, the first billing cycle in January. So all we do is we, um, we're assuming that the revenue accounting system is processing a coupon on a ticket with the INVOL endorsement. So the system has flagged that um, it appears the ticket has been reissued due to an irregular operation. Um, the first checkpoint is the two day rule and that is did the reissue occur two days or less from the departure date on the reissued ticket, so the first impacted flight. If this has occurred, the two day rule passes and the process continues. If this has uh, uh, not passed, then we're billing this as a planned schedule change and that's covered by a different section in the revenue accounting manual. So assuming the um, two day rule has passed, we go along and we check the five day rule and that occurs at the coupon level. And so does the coupon to be billed have a departure date five days or more from the date of reissue? If um, no, then the five day uh, rule has, has passed and we're billing uh, correctly as an involuntary reroute. If that five day uh, rule has failed, if the date is outside of that window, we're ignoring the involuntary designation and we're billing as a voluntary reissue. And so these are the standards that the um, airlines within the Revenue Accounting General Meeting have adopted um, and that takes effect from January. So again, just to step through a really simple example on the uh, involuntary uh, billing uh, piece, we've got a three coupon ticket we're assuming a Washington Paris departure on Tuesday night, a Paris Frankfurt departure on Wednesday, uh, connecting to a Frankfurt uh, Berlin departure on the same Wednesday. So if uh, the passenger successfully boarded the Washington Paris flight, um, but the flight arrived late into uh, Paris on Wednesday, we have an event that has occurred on the Wednesday. So the passenger has arrived late, that is the event, um, and this has led to a misconnection. So the first impacted flight of that event is the Paris Frankfurt flight. Um, we know that resolution 735D therefore applies. Any reissues that occur will include the INVOL endorsement, and that's just to get things moving on the airport side. If we then jump over to what the ticket looks like, the um, disrupting carrier, the carrier that has caused that uh, late arrival of the Washington flight, they've caused the disruption, it's their obligation to find uh, a solution to get the passenger through to Berlin and to reissue all the impacted coupons. 
So in this situation, the disrupting carrier has found an alternative flight. Um, the new flight is via Munich, so we've got Paris, Munich, Munich, Berlin. Unfortunately, they have not been able to get the, the passenger there on Wednesday as originally ticketed. The passenger has been reaccommodated onto Thursday uh, flights, um, but both of those reissued tickets have been, uh, both of those coupons have been reissued and the uh, 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 endorsement has been correctly applied. So if we, if we now take the uh, Munich Berlin coupon and we assume that we are the airline billing this coupon, we are going to process the two-day rule and the five-day rule within our revenue accounting system um, to, to ensure that we're billing this correctly. So the two-day rule occurs at the ticket level. We're looking at the date of reissue and we're looking at the first impacted flight on that ticket, regardless of which coupon we're billing. The two-day rule checks, uh, the two-day rule passes, and so we move on to the next process, which is the five-day rule. So the uh, five-day rule, we are looking at the um, actual coupon we're billing. We're looking at the day the coupon we're billing departs, and we're comparing that to the day the reissue occurred. In this situation, the five-day rule passes also. Um, the flight departs on a Thursday, the reissue has occurred on a Wednesday, so the five-day rule passes and we bill correctly as an involuntary uh, reroute. So again, um, this should be relatively straightforward to your revenue accounting teams. The key, key point with the revenue accounting changes is that the definition between the revenue accounting manual and resolution 735D is just slightly different. Resolution 735D looks at the event that went wrong and the revenue accounting manual looks at the day of reissue. And that's intentional because the systems will be processing uh, just slightly different information and, and looking at different processes. So that brings us to the end of the, um, the presentation today. We do just have a few minutes um, if there are any questions. Um, again, we'll do our very best to cover what we have today. Um, and if we miss any, we will include those in a frequently asked uh, uh, questions document that'll come out at the end of the session. So we've got a question on the um, Invol endorsement. Um, and that question, if I'm understanding this correctly, relates to um, whether it's just the first five characters that are uh, involved or whether it's the whole endorsement field. So the industry standard only talks about the first five characters. So if you if you have a genuine irregular operation, you must ensure that the first five characters are INVOL and you must not use INVOL in any circumstances but an irregular operation. What you then put in the remainder of the endorsement field is entirely up to you as an airline. So you may have other information that you would typically put in there to drive your own internal processes. Maybe it's a reference to the original flight. Maybe it's a reference to the, the interline partner you're using. The industry standard is just around those first five characters. Um, We've got a couple of other questions around who the accredited rep is from airlines um, and the follow-up to the webinar will shoot you out the link to where that information is available uh, publicly. Um, we have also got a question here on the uh, paper FIM document. So that's a, that's a very good question. The paper FIM document was actually removed from industry standards from the 1st of June 2016. So for the last sort of two or three years, um, that hasn't been supported by industry standard. So the industry standard now is the is the reissue of electronic tickets, um, and that gives you all the information you need to ensure that you can process um, process irregular operations correctly from a revenue accounting perspective. If you are still using uh, paper FIM documents, it's really important that you have a bilateral agreement in place with interline partners because this is no longer supported by um, industry standards. So that looks like um, all the questions that we had through, which is excellent timing because we've got one minute to spare. Um, again, thank you very much for your time today. Um, key message here is please make sure all this information gets through to all your impacted teams um, so that you're, you're able to process all these um, kind of action points that are required for the 1st of June. Um, you will be seeing these materials um, over the uh, next couple of days. Um, and if you do have any follow-up questions, you'll, you'll see an email address in those materials that you can shoot those through to. We'll do everything we can to help you. Um, so thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.